Okay. <clears throat> All right. So now we've got our data collection piece down. We're ready to get into the displaying of the data. How do we display it? How do we display our FBA data and how do we display our BIP data to determine whether or not we're being effic efficacious or not? Okay, so when we're talking about IEP goals, it requires data collection. And so this is, again, a federal mandate. We're supposed to do that. Our field, ABA, more than most fields, requires data gathered and displayed in graphs. So we really meet this need um, that the federal requirements have for us for IEPs because we're so used to using data to make decisions. So it's right up our alley. So what we're looking for when we graph our data is we're looking for changes in behavior. We're looking for um, uh, not whether behavior occurred or didn't occur. We're looking to see is behavior going up or going down or staying the same. So it changes it in the positive. Is it trending in the right direction or the wrong direction? Or are we seeing stability over time? Time. This helps us address the accountability issues that go into place with the legal ramifications of FBA and BIP. And simply for us, we want the data displayed so we can make better decisions. There's nothing better than going into an IEP meeting. It's like those three-hour or four-hour IEP meetings that, are, are, that you have for behavior problems and everybody in the room is talking about why they think Johnny is acting up. You know, because he's a delicate flower to, um, you know, his dog died to his best friend is going to be moving away. His girlfriend broke up with him. All of these things could be reasons for why people have. But then I come in with a graph and say, nope, he's doing it. People take his stuff. And so we get rid of the whole debate and the, the graph. You can't argue with the graph. The data are what they are. And so that's what's what's good about that. So the graphs are very, very important. Now, there's two types of graphs that we can typically use in FPA. Uh, one is bar graph, which we usually use for indirect assessment information. So our FAST, our MAST, our QBFs, um, these are things that are, are useful for that. Um, they can also show you means and stuff, but means are less important to us than the overall trends. And so that's where line graphs come into play. So most of the time we're going to use standard uh, line graphs. Sometimes a cumulative record graph might be useful. Um, uh, I use those sometimes in schools. Uh, and there's also standard acceleration charts for our precision teaching folks, which I'm not going to talk about. I just don't have the time to get into it. But that's another way that you can measure, measure progress as well in a BIP. So just staying with the bar graphs, um, again, for indirect assessments, any of these can work. It's usually um, uh, shown a, a mean of, of how people rate at something or if we're looking at overall problematic behaviors. So how many times did he occur, um, problematic behavior occur in gym class versus recess versus reading versus math and stuff like that. We can, we can do things along those lines. But it's rare for, for it to be used for that. So here's an example of a motivational assessment scale filled out for a kid um, by uh, uh, the teacher in the classroom. And so when you look at these bar graphs, it says that the, 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 the reason that problematic behavior occurred mostly by at least the, uh, the opinion of this particular teacher is that he does this behavior to get access to attention, followed closely by tangible reasons and then followed closely behind that by escape. And sensory reasons seem to be very, very low on the totem pole for this particular child's behavior. Okay, um, so to me, we use bar graphs when we're using indirect assessment information. I think it's a great way to depict that information. Um, it's oftentimes useful to uh, measure treatment from treatment plan A to B to C to see whether or not we're having an impact on behavior overall. But line graphs are really where the main gist of this comes from. We're going to use mostly line graphs with um, uh, data plotted along an axis. So when we're looking um, at a graph and you're creating a graph, and, and I literally teach people how to do this by taking simple paper and pencil and drawing it out. Just simply taking a piece of paper, writing out a, a, a little uh, x-axis and a y-axis, and then marking whatever your things on your x-axis are, how many sessions you're running, how many trials you're doing, and then numbering them and on your y-axis, having occurrences of the behavior listed along those lines. Now, you can do it low tech. Uh, I also have computer programs where I simply plug the data into it and it automatically graphs for me. So any one of these systems works. But the best part about it is we want the data to be done so that we can make decisions. We don't want to look at the data two days or a week later. We want to look at the data as we're collecting it. So um, uh, line graphs are good to show trends and relative occurrences of behavior. We can have single data points that are plotted or multiple data points that are plotted then are, that are connected across phases or, or connected within phases. Most commonly, we see line graphs in functional analyses or structural analyses. Um, we'll also see them in BIP evaluation. So we'll see them in both, both, um, both circumstances. 
So when we're making our, our FA graphs, we have the x-axis, which is usually our sessions or a time measure. And on our y-axis, we have problematic behavior and appropriate behavior. So for example, we're, we're keeping track of uh, aggression, but we're also keeping track of functional communication. We'll keep track of both of those. We'll just give the open circle the appropriate behavior, and we'll give problematic behavior the closed circle. And so we'll graph them accordingly. And then we simply plot the data as the data come alive. So when I'm doing a functional analysis, I'm literally graphing it as we go. Our y-axis uh, has, a, has a scale to it. If we, depending on the unit of measure that we're using, we'll use that. If we're looking at rate per minute or per hour or whatever, we'll put that on the, on the y-axis. If we're just counting a frequency count, we'll do that. Frequency within a 10-minute condition or the duration of it. We'll go from the zero to, if our observation is 10 minutes long, from zero to 10 minutes. We'll break that down in the seconds of like tantruming behavior. How much tantruming behavior occurred in, in 10 minutes? If the most that it could have happened is 600 seconds, then we put 600 seconds down. Uh, the percentage of correct, if we're doing academics, uh, how many percent did they of their math problems did they do right, or how many math problems did they attempt, whatever you want to do. And then you put a title over the overall thing indicating the measure that's being used, rate per minute of aggression and communication. So to simply put that down. Okay, so our y-axis, you want to determine the probable range of problematic behavior. So um, uh, th this is where you want to make sure that you're capturing the variability within the data. So if problematic behaviors occur um, uh, anywhere from like zero to five uh, aggressions per minute, then maybe we want to make the, the, the y-axis from zero to six so we can see the variability. Um, having it go from zero to 100, it's going to really make that data look really small, relatively speaking. If we're looking at the duration of a behavior and all classroom periods are 40 minutes long, then we make that to be the, the, the y-axis. If uh, classroom periods are 30 minutes long, then we make them 30 minutes long. So we, we make it uh, appropriately. We put tick marks along the x-axis, um, I'm sorry, the y-axis, as the, the, so the person who's reviewing it can look at it pretty clearly. So if we're doing 0 to 10 aggressions per minute, having tick marks at 2, 4, 6, and 8 per minute helps the, the, the reviewer see where, where the person is in the problematic behavior. Likewise, if we're doing percentages, 20%, 40%, 60%, 80% are appropriate to put on the y-axis as well. So people can follow along uh, the, the horizontal visual piece to see whether or not we um, have improvement in the behavior or not. Okay, makeup symbols, as I mentioned, open circles and closed triangles or open circles and closed circles, whatever you want to do um, for this. So if we're talking about uh, functional analysis and we only have one target behavior, uh, we have aggression as our only target behavior that we're interested in. So then maybe what we do is we graph the data according to the session. So how many aggressions occurred in free play and we go with a sip, uh, uh, one data point for all uh, free play conditions. If we have triangles for escape, then maybe we go with um, clo oh, closed circles for attention. Uh, we do uh, open triangle, or I'm sorry, open triangles for tangibles, and we do closed squares for alone conditions and plot our data according to that. Again, you plot the data as you collect it. You collect like data points, so you don't collect every data point to each other. You just connect the free plays with each other. You connect all the escape conditions together. You connect all of the attention conditions together and so forth. And you'll see an example of this coming up here. So add a legend if you need to, so people know what data points mean what, or you can put an arrow pointing to each one so that people know what conditions are. It's very useful when you go back and look at it six months later and you forget what, what, what's what. So it's helpful to make sure you do good labeling, and it's pretty straightforward, and here's the example that I was going to talk about. So this is thumb-sucking behavior from a teacher that I worked with when I was in Pennsylvania, and um, it occurred mostly uh, during alone conditions and occurred almost never during any of the other conditions of free play, tangible, escape, and attention. And they kept track of how many seconds of thumb sucking occurred. Sessions were 10 minutes long, and so the, um, they could have made the, the y-axis be 600 seconds because that's 10 minutes, but here it was seven and a half minutes or whatever 450 seconds is. I think it's yeah, about seven and a half minutes. And sessions were 10 minutes. Okay, we can indicate phase changes in, in well, we're gonna change gears here. So uh, when we're, that's our FA graph. So that's how an FA graph is done. This is how you do a BIP graph. So while you're evaluating um, your uh, function-based assessment data, you can still collect baseline data on your behavior intervention plan. And so what we do is we simply take our aggression and we can track it by day per, 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 per period. There's a lot of different ways that we can do this, but we simply start to chart it. Uh, most schools will do it day by day, 
um, but it doesn't have to be that way uh, if you're real sensitive to it. I've, I have graphs where I measure it for each class period and have separate graphs for each class period. So it really depends on how you wanna, how you wanna do it. But let's just make it simple and just have one graph for the entire day. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are on your X axis. And then you simply um, uh, connect data points that are within a phase. So if we're in baseline for a week, then we connect all five of those baseline data points together. And then we start treatment on day six, then we put in a phase line and then start a new set of data um, 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 uh, following that. So on session six, we now have a new data point that's not connected to data point five. So here's an example of, um, of a study that I uh, was part of. And this is Tony self-injury. And so what we have in his dormitory at the top is uh, where he lived, um, is that his rate of self-injurious behaviors per minute and then we phase change into a treatment called non-contingent reinforcement with extinction. And then we put in a phase line for that. And then those data points weren't connected. And we see a big burst of problematic behavior occur. And then it drops down to zero. Then we did some fading and it goes up and then drops down to zero. We fade it, we fade it, we fade it. And then it went up again. Then it dropped down to low levels. And then we brought in his parents and trained his parents. We also did a multiple baseline design. We did it in the classroom. So there's an upward trend in the classroom and they started treatment later than we did in the dormitory. And so um, we did the same fading plan with them and each time we faded, it looks like a little bit of, of self-injury occurred, uh, but eventually came back down to zero for him. So these graphs tell us that that treatment was working really, really well. And it told us exactly when we needed to make a phase change. So for us, Joe Lally's role on this was three consecutive day sessions in which problematic behavior was zero, we're gonna fade. And that was what his criteria were. And so we needed the graph to make the decision whether we were gonna stay or not. Here's another example of this. Uh, I can, I'm gonna go past this a little faster than that. But um, here we have a, a treatment in place in which they had an FCT and extinction. And then they added in that non-contingent reinforcement schedule. And then they have little dashed lines here to kind of show you the means. So with FCT plus extinction, it was higher than when NCR was in place. So when they added NCR in place, problematic behaviors were much lower uh, with that particular component in place for his, uh, this, this particular person's disruptive behavior. All right, so um, as I wrap this up um, uh, on, on data collection, so we now have data collection, we have defining the behavior, we have graphing the behavior. That's all very good from a, from, um, from a logistical standpoint. Now I want to get into some of the theory as to why we're doing what we're doing. So I want to talk a little bit about the two different models that are out there um, uh, that explain behavior and why we do what we do. So we have just did the what, now I'm gonna teach you the why. So this won't take us uh, too much longer, but these two models are very popular, uh, the ABC model and the SORC model. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about it. Now I got some jargon in here, so I apologize if jargon is, is, is beyond uh, some people in here because I'm not a big jargony guy. And, and in fact, I'm oftentimes wrong in my jargon, but I, I don't care too much about the jargon. No parent cares how smart you are. Most parents care, that, or teachers, care that you can help them with the kids with the behavior problems in your classroom. So if I'm wrong, you can send me an email on that. But um, my, my hope is that you get the conceptual aspect of this. So my, my, my sub quote here is, one person's SD is another person's S delta. Okay. So let's take a look at what that means. Okay, well, the important concepts that we're gonna to need to understand is you need to understand what discriminative stimulus is and stimulus control is. Now, stimulus control is a very, very powerful technology. We do things without wanting to think about them because of stimulus control. Um, we stop at traffic lights due to stimulus control. We can go to another country and we will still stop at a red light and go on a green light, right? even though we have no history of those working in those particular concepts. I go to England, they have a red light and a yellow light going on at the same time, and I think that just means go with caution, or it means a stop sign or something. You can still kind of overgeneralize, uh, but I'm still stuck on that because I'm never used to that, I'm not used to that stimuli. But for, for the most part, hundreds of times a day, I stop at a red light and I go on a green light, and very rarely do I go on a red light and stop at a green, uh, at a green light, but it does happen. So we're going to have to understand that concept. We'll, we'll get into that. Setting events are stuff that's often brought up. And, and one of the big issues that a lot of people have, and I've struggled with this, and so if you don't get this yourself the first time around, you're in good company because I, don't, I struggle getting this too. What is the difference between a setting event and an establishing operation? or a motivating operation, whichever way you want to call it. Call it. Um, most people are uh, familiar with calling establishing operations motivating operations, um, but sometimes those, those terms are used interchangeably. So I'm gonna to toggle between those two, uh, motivating operations and um, establishing operations. 
Uh, and abolishing operations are the flip side of the coin, and we'll get into that as we, we talk about it. They're fancy words for very simple concepts, so we'll get into that. Okay, so the first of these things that most people are used to is the ABC model of behavior. And simply, ABC is antecedent behavior and consequence. It's very straightforward. You know, you have an antecedent, what was the antecedent that occurred prior to the behavior, and then what happened after the behavior occurred? Because the, the reason behavior occurred is because the antecedent triggered it and because the consequence reinforces it. That's what makes behavior happen, and that's what makes behavior persist between those two things. The AB relationship makes a behavior occur, and the BC relationship it determines whether or not that the f future likelihood of that behavior is going to go up or go down. And so in my example here, if, if you can't read it real clearly, I'll read it to you. The antecedent is that Arnold um, uh, is told to do his math, his math homework. So that was the antecedent. The behavior that happened immediately following that was that Arnold stopped working on his homework and scribbled on the wall. So two things happened. He stopped engaging in the math work, and then he engaged in scribbling on the wall. Then Arnold's mom sent him to the timeout place. Okay, so the consequence that followed scribbling on the wall was going to timeout. Okay, so the antecedent triggered the behavior of him scribbling on the wall, and the consequence of scribbling on the wall was going to timeout. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Nothing, nothing super special. There's no super secret here at all. It's just very straightforward. Okay, so the antecedent behavior consequence piece. It, it simply is that an antecedent is a stimulus that occurs prior to the behavior. Again, it's just something happens. Something happened and we may not notice it. So as an example of this, when I was in uh, middle school, uh, when I saw a gym teacher uh, who taught our health class go to his desk, and, I, or, and when he was going over to the desk, he was going to pull out the books that meant that we were going to have to do independent work. We were going to have to sit there and uh, read a book in there. And so when I saw him engaging in that stimulus, I then engaged in problematic behavior to get out of doing that, that work. Now, nobody in the room could discern that he did something because he didn't do it yet. But I knew he was going, he was walking, there was movement, he was going towards the cabinet where the books were, and so I beat him to the punch before he got to the books. So it didn't ha happen for no apparent reason, it happened for a very apparent reason if you were astute enough to see what actually happened. But most people would have missed that, a novel person would have missed that. So basically, with an antecedent, it's simply a stimulus that occurs prior to the behavior. The child can discriminate it, but sometimes the adults can't. So, so it's, it usually happens just prior to the behavior. It's not something that happened 15 minutes ago, although that can happen at times. Now, the behavior that occurs, again, gets back to our definition of a behavior. It's something that we can see or hear that two or more people can easily agree occurred or not occurred. So if I insulted the teacher and called him, Charlie Brown, you're a clown, um, you could hear that I did that. <laughs> And then you can see that the stimulus that occurred after that is me going to the principal's office happened right after that. And that stimulus was presented as well. But I accomplished my goal of not having to do the stupid, silly, dumb uh, sex ed class or whatever that we were going to have to read about. So that was a very easy thing for me to escape or avoid in that particular case. My behavior was not random in any way, shape, or form. Now let's take that same example under the SORC model. Now under SORC, what we have is that it's a stimulus instead of antecedent that's basically the same thing. So it's synonymous, so our S and the antecedent are exactly the same thing. Our O, we're going to come back to that. Our R is the response, which is basically the target behavior, so it's the B, and consequences is exactly the same thing as we see in ABC. So S and R are exactly the same thing as in A and B, and consequences are still the same. So the only thing that's different in this particular equation is organismic variables. And so organismic variables are things that happen within the skin of the child that we may or may not be aware of or can quantify. These can be physical issues, like I'm ill. It could be medical issues, like I'm, um, I'm having stomach pains. It could be physiological in that I'm not getting enough sleep. It could be cognitive in that I don't know how to do this math homework, or I don't like, um, um, I don't like um, um, uh, going through this reading material that's beyond my ability to do. Or it could be psychological issues. I really am uncomfortable with sexual education classwork. And so I'm engaging in any of these behaviors for, for whatever reasons. And, and let's just say, and this has not happened, I'm not being autobiographical when I say this, let's just say that I have been uh, sexually abused. And so talking about that kind of stuff might be something I'd want to avoid, right? So, and I haven't, just making sure there's some clarifications on that in case people are worried, but I'm just using that as an example. So in each of those things, any one of those variables can also have an impact on behavior. So understanding the O is really what this is about. Now, 
in both models, whether you use the ABC model or the SORC model, it assumes that behavior occurs lawfully. It, it occurs to changes in the environment if it's maintained by social consequences. The only exception to this is if the behavior is maintained by automatic reinforcement. If behavior is maintained by automatic reinforcement, this becomes a little bit more loose, but it still usually applies. Now, when we're dealing with social consequences or social functions, if we change the teacher behavior, the child will change their behavior as well. When we do our stuff in behavior intervention planning, we're really changing the adult behaviors or we're changing the environment. We're changing the environment so that the child can accomplish what they're trying to accomplish with their problematic behaviors through other means, usually appropriate behaviors. And so that's what's really good. If we can get the teacher to respond to the appropriate behaviors and not the inappropriate behaviors or less often than the inappropriate behaviors, we will usually see an impact on the child's behavior. So from this standpoint, you can go with the AB influence. So one of the things that we can change for the teacher in that particular you know, situation is to change the antecedents that trigger the behavior. So we're just going to avoid any kind of sexual education class with Sean. That will, not, that will reduce him insulting the teacher to get sent to the office, right? So that's one way of doing it, okay? That, that's certainly one way we can do it. But it also has an impact on my adaptive behavior because now I'm not learning about a content that part of whatever curriculum that they're supposed to be teaching, right? So there, there's one way that that, that that can actually play a role. And that's certainly one way of people that do treatment. And I know many behavior analysts that really only focus on antecedent manipulations. And the problem with that is that we really don't deal with the functional relationship between the problematic behavior and the consequences that follow that. So we'll talk about that in a, in a slide or two. Now, when uh, a trigger happens, uh, why does that occur? Why did I insult them, um, the, the teacher and get sent out of the room Charlie Brown, you're a clown. Well, stimulus control is one explanation, right? So I know what he was doing. He was going to grab those books out of there, and so therefore I engaged in the behavior to do so. Okay, that's one. Setting events. Okay, well, what are setting events? Well, we'll get into that too, but setting events could be one of the pieces that come into that, and motivating operations could also be the other one, and we're going to talk about both of those as, as we go along. So stimulus control, really quickly, is that when an antecedent signals um, uh, that a behavior is likely to be reinforced. So, and, and stimulus control, and again, I like this with um, um, uh, cars and, and some other pieces to this as well, but let's stay with the example that I have here on my slide, is that a, a, a discriminative stimulus, or an SD, is an antecedent that serves as an appropriate cue to occasion a response. So if I'm taking a test and I say this, if I whisper to somebody, what's the answer to number five? People don't give me the answer to number 12. <laughs> People give me the answer to number five, or they tell the teacher, John's asking for answers on the question. <laughs> so, that, so that's an SD. So when I give the question, I'm going to get a response from people, and uh, my, my point there is I'm trying to get the answer to that question. Likewise, when I see that he's going to the, to the, the, uh, the book closet to pull out those books, that's a discriminative stimulus for me to insult the teacher because that's what's going to get me to escape or avoid having to do that. It's very unlikely for him to say, nah, you're going to have to still do this. You get to go to the office after you do your work. That's not likely the consequence that typically follows. I usually get sent out of the room, therefore I'm going to, going to do that. That's the SD for me to trigger, that triggers that behavior. Okay, for an S-delta. Um, and that's a different thing altogether. An S-delta is an antecedent stimulus that serves as an appropriate cue that a response is not likely to be reinforced. So we see this a lot in classrooms in which uh, who knows the answer to question number five? The teacher asks that question. It's not in a test. And then uh, people blurt out the answers, right? So instead of uh, the teacher responding to them, the teacher then says, who knows the answer to number five and raises their hand? That is an S-delta to not blurt out the answer. It's also an SD to raise your hand. So as I raise my hand, it's an S delta to reduce blurting, but also an SD to increase hand raising. So one stimulus can serve as, as, as that for both of them. Again, um, taking traffic signals is a way to go, uh, is that when I come to a red light, right, um, that's an SD to, to do what? That's an SD to hit the brakes. It's also an S delta to press the gas pedal. So when I see uh, um, a red light, that is not the time to press the, the, uh, the gas pedal. Um, so don't do that. That's not going to be reinforced. Or it could be reinforced, but there's likely to not be reinforced, either getting a ticket or into an accident. Um, but hitting the brake, uh, tapping the brake, means that I avoid, successfully avoid either of those consequences. So just kind of give you the example of that. 
uh, and that's what this slide is all about. So green and that. Another SD, just for an example on this, is the police car. So we all do this, right? We're speeding down the highway, and we're going about 75 miles an hour on the 70, and we're not even necessarily over the threshold for where they're gonna pull us over. But we automatically, as soon as we see that police cruiser in the middle of the highway, not pulled over, just sitting there with his little you know, radar gun, we automatically, without even thinking about it, at least take our foot off the gas pedal. We can be going under the speed limit, and we will still do that. If we're not taking our foot off the gas pedal, we're at least looking at our speed to see whether or not we're going to do that. And the reason we do that is we try to avoid getting a ticket or being pulled over and delayed in our ability to get to our reinforcing destination. So SDs are very, very powerful um, antecedents that make us do things without us even thinking about them. Um, the school bell out in the schoolyard. Kids uh, will argue with parents when they say, come on in, it's time to eat. Oh, mom, can I stay out a little longer? Well, in school bell, nobody goes and argues with the bell. Can you give me five more minutes so we can finish our game? Because it doesn't respond that way. So when, when the bell rings, we go stand in line. You know, we go right over and get in line to go in the, in the class or recesses are over. Or it means it's one more throw for the kickball team. You know, get one more at bat. The teacher stands in front of the room and doesn't respond while the class is being rowdy and sooner or later everyone else starts to quiet down because the teacher is becoming an S NSD for it's time to keep your quiet voice. Okay, time to not sit quietly. Going outside in the schoolyard is the best time that you can yell. Yelling is not an inappropriate behavior unless it's in context. It's, uh, yelling is a great thing when your sporting team is winning a football game or your favorite race car driver is going across the finish line or whatever it happens to be. That's not the time to sit quietly, but when you're in a library, yeah, you are. You're supposed to be quiet under those things. So stimulus control is very, very powerful for us. Now, how this works is through discrimination. The child has the ability to determine the difference between when certain behaviors are more likely to not be reinforced. So when a substitute teacher comes in, oh, this is the time to make funny names on the, on the attendance sheet, right? That's the SD for doing that. Um, oh, we don't have homework. We don't get homework on, on these days. You know, the, you know, the, we all do the same. All kids do the same things, right? So good stimulus control is the relationship between the antecedent and the cue to serving the behavior. If the substitute teacher doesn't play into those things, then, they, then um, those behaviors go away. But, but the, the whole idea here is that when, when, when stimulus control occurs, we automatically will engage in behaviors that we didn't think we would normally do. Okay, so now I want to circle back to setting events and motivating operations. So setting events and motivating operations are confusing concepts. So when we're talking about how antecedents have an influence on behavior, stimulus control and discriminative stimuli and, and, and S-deltas also have a big impact on that. But there's other reasons that we also will engage or not engage in specific behaviors. And this has to do with these two concepts. So setting events are conditions, events, sensations that affect the probability of a behavior to be reinforced under normal conditions. So we can see an increase in challenging behaviors or a decrease in appropriate behaviors based off of these setting events. Now setting events generally refer to long-term antecedents that we never can tell has hap happened or not happened, and they usually happen outside of our knowledge. So an example of a setting event is that when I go to the, uh, the, my uh, sex ed class and I just broke up with my, my girlfriend three weeks before prom, this again is not autobiographical, uh, but when I broke up with my girlfriend, I am more likely to get, he is going to get on my last nerve real quickly when he's asking me to do something like, okay, we're going to go through sex ed. Okay, normally I can tolerate it, but today is not the day. And so Charlie Brown, you're a clown. You're out of here. I wouldn't normally engage in that behavior, but because of the setting event, the aversiveness of the task that he's given me, has, my threshold has, has dropped. And as soon as he presents me that demand, I'm now likely to do it where I normally wouldn't have. If I didn't break up with my girlfriend, I probably would not have engaged in that particular behavior in that particular case. Or if my dog didn't die. Or if my grandmother wasn't sick in the hospital. Things that can come into play that the person who is, is receiving the behavior doesn't know. They're giving an antecedent that they give over and over and over again that doesn't evoke problem behavior usually, but today it did. And so if something else is going wrong, we don't know what it is. And it's usually that's the case of a setting event culprit. It's not what caused the behavior. I don't want to do the work, but I normally don't make fun of the teacher to get out of doing it. I do it begrudgingly or I do it poorly, but I don't actually engage in problematic behavior to get out of it. But in this particular case, I did. And that's due to a setting event issue. 
Again, a lot of different reasons that are setting events. It can be illnesses, sleep deprivation. So kids that don't come to school or didn't get a whole lot of sleep. Environmental, that uh, this is why we have free and reduced pr lunch programs because setting events affect the kids' learning. And so we make sure that they get food before they come into school. Um, social events, so again, a friendship dissolves, a pending divorce by their parents, things like that. These are things that can come into play. Now again, make sure you understand the setting events are not a function. Uh, the PBQ, the Positive Behavior Questionnaire, actually identifies setting events as a potential function for problematic behavior, and it just isn't. It's a temporary effect that, that, that usually goes away after a period of time, but it doesn't by itself directly impact behavior. I, I'll tell you what it does in, in, a, in a slide or two. Well, this one. So basically, setting events are things that are outside of our control that affect the response reinforcer relationship. It changes the value of reinforcer. In my case, escape is the reinforcer. So escape has increased its value in reinforcement. Now I'm willing to engage in problematic behaviors for no apparent reason. And so that's what's important about that. Now, there's ways we can also see appropriate behaviors be that way. So if my, my, um, I, my girlfriend just broke up with me, I'm now nicer to the other girls in the classroom, particularly the girl that was interested in me that, that I wasn't interested in because I had a girlfriend, and now this girl is interested in me, or I want her to be interested in me because I need a prom date. <laughs> so I'm new super nice guy now. And again, this is not autobiographical. I'm a nice guy anyway. But I'm super nice now because I need a prom date, and I've invested in a tux, and so I want to make sure I have something to go with blah, blah, blah. And so you can fill in whatever examples you want. So understanding setting events may help us understand why behavior is occurring under atypical uh, circumstances, but there's nothing we can do about it. The, the gym teacher can't get me a girlfriend to go to prom. That He can't fix that problem. He's just going to have to deal with it, but now at least he understands why the problematic behavior occurred. He may be able to do some minor things, but I'm still going to my threshold for engaging in escape maintained behavior is lower and when people are going to give me stuff that I don't want to do I'm more likely than less likely to engage in problematic behaviors because of this as long as this um, setting event is still intact and it's meaningful to me. Okay, our, uh, let's go back to our ABC model. Our setting event, Arnold doesn't have the math skills. So in this particular example we've added the S yes to the equation. So the setting event here says Arnold doesn't have the math skills to do his homework. So we're giving him grade level work that he doesn't have the ability to do. So when he's told to do his math homework, he scribbles on the wall because he can't do it. And so he gets sent to his room and he's getting exactly what he wants. He's going to time out and therefore he gets to escape the task. I will do that seven times a week and twice on Sunday when you're asking me to do something that I can't do. Asking me to do rocket science, I can't do it. No matter how many times you cheer me on, I can't do it. And so I'm going to scribble on the wall eventually because that's the only way I can get away from it. Okay, so that's setting events to beat that horse to death. Okay, motivating operations. The last of the concepts that I want to talk about here is, is often confused with setting events, but it's different, but it's the same. And so that's a really horrible answer, isn't it? But it is. Motivating operations are not antecedents. They have to do with the concepts of satiation and deprivation of a specific reinforcer. So let's talk about those. So satiation occurs when the child has had their fill of their reinforcer. It means that I've lessened it. I've, I've, uh, I've played with the iPad for three straight hours and using it now as a reinforcer to me isn't going to work. You have a Cheeto program in place for me. I've just eaten lunch. The Cheetos are not that valuable to me after I've just had a very big lunch. And so my, my motivation has gone down, therefore I'm not gonna work for that reinforcer that I would normally work for before lunch. Okay, so deprivation occurs when the child has not had access to a reinforcer for a period of time. And so I often use this for very big goals. So if we have a kid that really likes something, so like if, if, if the kid likes iPad and I want him to eat broccoli, this is a great thing to restrict. So you get access to the iPad if you take a bite of broccoli. The value of the iPad has gone up tremendously and the behavior that they wouldn't normally engage in, they're now going to engage in because it's the only way they can access that particular reinforcer. And so they'll do what they need to do to accomplish that. Now, we can't really control what goes on with um, uh, deprivation and satiation, but we can do some manipulations to it. Uh, most teachers in the classrooms have very little direct control over these, over these variables. So understanding them is more important, but we can, to some level, take advantage of them to a, to a greater extent at least than we can with setting events. Now, when, when satiation occurs, oh, did this skip this? Yeah, okay, sorry, did I skip this slide? <clears throat> 
Um, so when we look at this particular slide, so sa satiation occurs when uh, the child has, has had their reinforcer, um, has, had, has had their fill of the reinforcer, so it lessens the value of the reinforcer. Deprivation occurs when the child has not had access to the reinforcer for a certain period of time, therefore it's an increased in value. And these two concepts are known as abolishing operations and establishing operations. So an, an establishing operation is, is really talking about the issue of deprivation. I'm now established to earn that as a reinforcer. Like I said, the iPad has been uh, um, uh, deprived of me, so that serves as an establishing operation for me to take a bite of broccoli, what I normally wouldn't have done. The abolishing operation of the Cheetos after lunch is I'm full, and therefore I'm not going to work for that anymore because it's now abolished or reduced the effectiveness of that as a reinforcer for me. The value of it has changed. And so these are some of the examples, uh, and I just talked about those, using edibles after lunch and before lunch. Um, using computers as a reinforcer after the child has been able to play with it all morning, using the computer when the child hasn't played with it over the whole weekend. So on a Monday, it's going to be more valuable of a reinforcer. I'm a big football fan. I'm a big Eagles fan. Uh, and so watching football when my team is doing really poorly at week 16 when the season's really long and my team has been beaten a lot, I'm not likely to watch. It's an abolishing operation for me. But watching, the week, uh, uh, watching football in week one when my team has a chance, I'm into it. And then my, 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 I pique my interest again as the Super Bowl comes up because the ads are just so good oftentimes. They're sometimes really bad too, but um, I'm, I'm more interested as we get to the end of that. And another reason for that is that deprivation is going to occur after the Super Bowl. There's no more chances to watch football until the next fall. So I want to see and savor that last bite of steak of football season as I possibly can. Okay, so in the ABC model, um, uh, Arnold doesn't have the math skills. That's the setting event, right? And the ABC still works there. But our establishing operations can certainly be that John's worked straight for three hours doing his work at home. And so, I'm sorry, it should say Arnold. Uh, Arnold has been working on task for three hours straight. So he's going to increase his escape and avoidant behaviors. And so as a result of that, um, that establishing operation is going to trigger, more than likely, uh, uh, escape maintained behaviors to do that. And so here we go with Arnold. He doesn't have the math skills. Arnold's asked to do his math homework. The setting event increases the likelihood of him scribbling on the wall and then getting sent to timeout is going to reinforce his future likelihood of engaging in that behavior again because he got escape or got what he wanted to accomplish. I've been working too darn long. I'm done now. Fine. Send me to my room. I don't care. So why is there confusion between setting events and uh, motivating operations? It's simply because both of them have the same influence on the, the value of a reinforcer. Both of them affect the value of a reinforcer. Setting events can be identified as an antecedent where MOs cannot. They're usually internal states that we have no ability. We can't open up a kid's head and say, yep, he's really sufficiently deprived now. It's something that we can um, um, have to kind of guess at. Um, both serve to increase or decrease the specific behavior's frequency because the value of the reinforcer has changed. So some people will use these terms interchangeably even though they are slightly different. We have some influence, some slight influence over what we can do with MOs. We have almost no influence over setting events. So as I summarize this, as this conceptual concept of this, for an FBA to have any kind of utility um, as well as the BIP, we absolutely 100% of the time need to be able to define the behaviors of concern with eliminating subjectivity as much as we possibly can. We then have to collect data on the specific behaviors of concern. We're not here to measure points on a rubric. We're, and not that those are bad, they're good tier one interventions. But when we're in tier three with a kid, we need to be measuring the specific behaviors of concern. We can we have to graph these data so that we can make good decision making rather than shooting from the hip, which many behavior analysts will still do. They'll collect the data but not look at it. They'll make judgments off of what they saw rather than looking at the graphs themselves. And that's bad, that's bad practice. So make sure you graph it and look at it before you make your decisions. And then when behavior seems to be so random and unlawful and just out of the blue, the culprit usually is something around the setting event or the motivating operation standpoint. And so we're looking at the antecedents and the behaviors, and sometimes it occurs and sometimes it doesn't. And boy, when we look at, well, he's been working for two straight hours and hasn't had a break, that seems to be where his problems are occurring, then maybe we need to mess around with the motivating operations or give this guy some more breaks. Or that he has cycles within his problematic behaviors. Well, that might be a setting event, and has to, his problematic behaviors have to do with the allergies that are going on uh, aller during allergy season, and, and they go down when allergy season's gone away because he feels crummy. 
And so, so, so there are some things, again, that we can, we can look at with that. So um, thank you for your time with that. I wanted to just kind of um, uh, highlight that, that this is just the beginning of things. So you got a little bit of conceptualization on why behaviors occur with um, uh, antecedents, behaviors, and consequences between the two different models, SORC and ABC. Um, uh, the, the difference between the models really have to do with the establishing operations and setting events are factored into the SORC model, which is why it's a more, to me, a more accurate version of the, 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 the model, because it's more than just antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. But antecedents, behaviors, and consequences are the pieces that we control. The other part here is that when we're doing FBAs and BIPs, we need to keep track of how we're, we need to keep track of the data that, so that we can determine whether or not we're done with our assessment, we can move on to treatment. And when we're in treatment, when do we keep with the treatment? When do we change the treatment? When do we go on to the next treatment? Or when do we fade or generalize that? So we need to make our decisions based off of the data. So um, I want to thank you guys for letting me do this. And again, I, I appreciate the, 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 the course that you're trying to embark on. And um, we were able to do this in Iowa, and you have no reason why you can't do this where, where you're at here. It's just a matter of putting the things together and doing it systematically. So I wish you good luck. Thank you, guys. If you contact me, my information's here.